Ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? It's your boy, Ben Gothard, your friendly neighborhood entrepreneur. You know what? I thought that was going to be cool, and it, it just kind of sounded a little weird. But anyways, right now, we have the honor of speaking with Matt Thompson, who is a lifestyle architect and general badass. And he agreed to come on to talk about NLP, which if you don't know what that is, you're about to know exactly what that is, hypnosis, and general badassery. So with that, Matt, please jump right in. <laughs> yeah, the general badassery part is definitely my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with uh, NLP, for those that don't know, is Neuro Linguistic Programming, um, <clears throat> which is using language to program your brain and, and how you actually receive uh, verbal information. And hypnosis is the process of going around the conscious mind to the subconscious and tweaking your belief system until they jive with what it is you are actually all about deep down. And general badassery is what we're doing right now. And general badassery. <laughs> So, so let's let's dive into NLP. So, what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that um, it's the effect of language on on us, on our subconscious, on our on our what? Like how? how like maybe you could dive really deep into that. Yeah. So I'll I'll start by asking you a question. We'll have a little exercise here to to evaluate that. Um, yes, I love being the guinea pig. I want you to tell me what comes to your mind, whether it's sights, smells, whatever it is, when I give you certain words, okay? Okay. So let's start with an easy one, happiness. Smile. And are you seeing a smile in your head or are you just thinking of the word? Is it a fun time that makes you smile? I literally just associate the word happiness with smile. But I guess to go deeper into that, um, I smile when I'm happy, and like I find myself smiling a lot when I'm doing interviews and streams like this. So I guess like behind that is like doing things that make me smile, or things that make me happy make me smile, which means that I'm happy. So you're smiling a lot is is what you're saying. It, yeah. Okay. Cool. So fear. What comes to your mind? Not living up to my potential and wasting everything that I've been given. Mm. And what would that look like in a in a tangible physical setting? You know, honestly, it would it would look like it would look like me giving up. Um, you know, I, I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because of the the family that I have. Um, you know, I. I truly truly am so eternally grateful to my parents um they're the greatest people in the world um and if if i were to if i were to not live up to my potential or give it everything i've got or do something that is that's good right and actually try to help help other people and, and make an impact on the world then i'd be wasting everything that they've given and they've sacrificed to give me and that I'm deathly afraid of. Also, being like super old and looking back and saying, I wish I had more time. I am so afraid of that. Hmm. That's, I, I want to jump on that, but that'll go off on a different tangent, so I won't. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So what happens when you hear those things, whether you're consciously aware of them or not, you... So we'll take fear, for instance, because it's much more meaty than, than happiness sounded. Um, when you're saying even the word, like, I'm afraid of this or this scares me, anything that's around fear, in the back of your mind is that scenario playing. So the emotions that you attribute to that scenario is what you're going to be feeling when you're using that kind of fear-associated language. So NLP is teaching you to change that language for something that actually 
uh, helps you achieve what it is that you really want because you don't want to fail. So if you're focusing on not failing, all you're going to get is more not failing, which is failure. You're not going to be succeeding. You're just going to be struggling with not failing. So if you can switch fear to, um, I don't know, what, what motivates you to, to do what you're doing? Freedom. Freedom. Perfect. So freedom is actually, this is great. So freedom is the subconscious at its finest. It's just doing whatever it wants all the time and you really can't do anything about it. So when you're thinking freedom, like for me anyways, I already feel lighter just saying freedom. Like it is literally freeing to just say the word freedom. So if you're thinking about, you know, what that freedom is going to bring you and your family and business and other entrepreneurs in your life and the things that you're out to do, rather than focusing on not failing, you're going to do 10, 20 times more successful actions than you would be if you were focusing on not failing. So it's, it's, it seems really easy to be able to do, but if you actually take five minutes to listen to the play that goes on in your head and all the nonsense that we say to ourselves, it seems like the stack is against us to actually do anything that we want. Wow. So it's training us to actually take conscious control of the subconscious, which is kind of weird because you, you, you can't really. You can influence it. It's like if you were going on Google your conscious mind is what you're typing into the Google search, and then Google's going to bring you whatever it matches with all the words that are in that sentence of what you're searching. So you don't have control of what it brings you. You only have the request control. That's cool. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm, so I'm interested. You said you wanted to, to jump on that earlier when we were talking about fear. What did you yeah. want to jump on exactly? It was, I can tell that you've spent a lot of time on that particular thought. Like you were, you were able to paint that picture. So I would say accurately without spending too much time thinking about it, but I can tell that you spend a lot of time actually thinking about that. So, so does that mean I'm holding myself back by thinking about that too much? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I hate to say that anything is possible, but anything's possible. Uh, I would say that it's a stronger pathway in your brain than you probably want it to be. Because when, when you have those subconscious trains of thought, if you're not looking at it and paying attention, then you don't know the impact that it's actually having on your day-to-day -day practices. So it might be nonsense that has no effect on you, and it might be like the one thing that's actually holding you back from your biggest achievement. Wow. That is like very material. That like that could have a serious impact on people's lives. How do you, how do you dig deeper and figure out the impact that those um i don't know if it's a negative but but that like the the fear right like how how would i dig down and understand the impact that that has mm -hmm. so the the very first step before digging into anything is just listening to how you speak to others to yourself about things that you're doing to yourself and others especially um I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of people say, I kind of want to do this. I sort of wish I could do that. Like it's not, it's not like totally available. It's like a dream, but I want to do this. Well, the odds are good. You're going to actually do that because you're saying, you know, I want to do this. This is actually something I want to do. I'm going to take real action on it. So it's just, looking at what you're saying, becoming aware of the type of language that you're using, and then you can kind of 
follow that path of language and be like, oh, this is why I'm doing maybe less workouts over here when I know I want to be, you know, chiseled and a beast and I'm just, I'd rather do this or I don't feel like it, right? That's usually what comes up for me and I would, I would say most guys, most people in general is just, you know, I don't have the time is the big one. And underneath, I don't have the time often cases and in my experience is I'm actually not worth the time and then when you get to I'm not worth the time it's like okay well when did you start actually saying that and there's going to be some instant where maybe somebody literally told you you're not worth their time so now you've taken that internally and subconsciously and you're like well if I'm not worth their time I'm not going to be worth my own time and then you just hide that with better and better cheating language and then you become less and less aware of it and then the impacts are less and less of like a stab in the face if you know what i mean wow so okay so so let me see if let me see if i'm if i'm understanding this correctly so it seems like the language that you use is both an indicator of what your subconscious is uh, is is bringing back up, like like the Google search, right? Like that, it, it it almost seems like it goes both ways. Like if you if you see like what you're putting in, that that could almost be like a um, like the words that you use, it's like a window inside of what you're thinking and, and your thoughts. But it seems like at the same time, the words that you continue to choose to use will then influence your subconscious and it's almost like a self-perpetuating cycle if it's keep continuing to go down one route or if you choose to try to pivot that not try to if you choose to pivot that see there it is if you choose to pivot that then you can break the pattern and start influencing your subconscious in a different way is that kind of what you're saying or yeah, is that what it, you're saying it's exactly what you just discovered in tripping up on that kind of saying like, like what you just said you caught yourself because you were consciously aware of it and then it changed the outcome of that particular sentence or you know that is, it's exactly what i'm saying <laughs> so then how do you continue to be very intentional about your language to the point where you are influencing influencing your subconscious um, there's, I would say, an infinite way of doing so. So it, that's kind of a hard one to answer for other people. So I'll just speak solely from my own experience and how I do it. I say very, very little through the course of my life. I'm a very intentionally quiet person who's listening for conversations that I actually want to be a part of. Um, and in being more of a listener than a speaker, I have, I hear what might be coming up. It's not what I want and it's not going to further what I'm up to. So I just let it go and don't say anything at all. Or if it's a persistent thing that keeps coming up, like I don't feel like it is like my nemesis. It's super easy and it's got tons of hooks and baggage on it. So when I get stuck in and I don't want to, and I'm just sitting on the couch kind of wasting my day, I will switch it to, like, I want to go get something from the fridge, like something to get me up and out of that process I'm stuck in. And then when I get to the fridge, it's like, okay, now that I'm up and I'm no longer, you know, doing what I was doing before, which was nothing, I can choose something else to do and just keep doing that consciously until it's kind of washed away. And then I go about things that I intended to do in the first place. Now, here's a question for you. What happens when you're not aware of this? Like, how do you snap into or maybe it's not a snap, maybe it's a gradual thing, but how do you become self-aware of, and, and I know we talked about it a little bit, but like maybe we could, 
I know we talked about it a little bit, but I really want to drill down into acquiring that pervasive self-awareness, not a one-time thing, but a constant state of awareness. Mm. Constant state of awareness is interesting because to be aware constantly, you almost can't be aware that you're constantly aware. It's a real mind F. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first step is definitely, um, I, I don't know, for me it's listening to a podcast that makes me think about something different. You always know when you're thinking about something new because you have a physical reaction to it or at least a, a definite, oh, you know, that's interesting. I've never considered that. So if you can if you can have those, then you're in the perfect place to just decide that you are going to take on the journey, let's call it, of becoming aware. So that's step number one is just deciding you're gonna do it, throwing your hat over the fence and then figuring out how to get over the fence and get your hat. Um I can say that step two, uh an easy thing that works for a lot of people is keeping a notebook of words that keep coming up, um, both desirable and undesirable words. Uh, one of the people that I was working with recently, he's uh, an immigrant from Colombia, and he's been, I think he's been here, he said 14 years, and he still feels like he's an immigrant and not a Canadian citizen yet. And in his head, it's just immigrant, immigrant, immigrant that's playing over and over in his head, never like one of these people. So I had him look at, well, who, first of all, called you an immigrant the first time because it's never something you're going to call yourself because that would be really bizarre to be like, oh, I'm an immigrant all of a sudden. So we got to that, and it turned out that it was his dad, like, we're going to immigrate here, we're going to be immigrants, is literally what he said. So then it's, he was excited to, to immigrate to a better place. He was going to have a better life. And then his parents split up as soon as they moved here. So now being an immigrant is a bad thing because it destroyed my parents' relationship. So now there's one negative thing attached to it. But luckily he was young enough that he, was, he had enough gumption to be like, no, it's still good. It's new. So then he was in school and people were making fun of him because he spoke Spanish and didn't speak English. And they were you know, pretty much just being racist to the guy. So now he's got hundreds and hundreds of different negative words throwing at him every day while he's in school, but he doesn't, he, he consciously hears them, but he doesn't feel them yet. They're just being internalized and creating this weird story. So now, 15 years later, he's 32, he still dresses like a teenager, he doesn't have long-term relationships, he still lives by himself, and he can't really do anything that you would think of when you're an adult that you'd be able to do. So I had him work backwards from where he's at, looking at the positive things that he tried to do that he missed, and then we looked at what had him miss those. And it was always this, well, I'm an immigrant, I can't do it. So for him, it was super specific, it was almost 100% this immigrant story that he had, which I, in Canada, I'd say more than 50% of Canada is probably a, like a, a recent immigrant. Um, so I'd say it's a pretty common story here. So I had him work backwards right to before his dad told him that he was an immigrant. I said, when you knew that you were moving, you know, what was going on in your mind? And it was just like joy joy and excitement and I said well what what was the vision because he you know you have a vision anytime new information comes in it's gonna change my life this is what it's gonna look like so what it looked like for him was just like the friends TV show he's gonna be hanging out in coffee shops with new cool people they're all gonna be from different walks of life and that's that's what he expected and it's not what he got then I had him look at where could he have hit that 
but chose not to try to do it, which is slightly the same thing, but a very different action. Because now it's a conscious choice not to get that thing that I want. So I had him look at that. And every time, it wasn't the immigrant story, which was really interesting. It was actually the, I don't think I want this. I think I want something else. So the thing that he wanted, that he still wants, he ended up telling himself he doesn't want, he wants something else. But he never chose something else. So something else never comes, like tomorrow. Tomorrow's always tomorrow, never going to be today. So he's gone 15 years with, I'm an immigrant and I can't do this, and I choose not to choose something to have. So those two things, interestingly enough, do not work out to get a really exciting full life. So then when he realized this, and that took many weeks to get through all of this, so then when he realized this, it was like looking into the eyes of a child. He's like, this makes total sense. What do I do with it now? I said, good, now that you're aware of it and you're aware of what led you to where you're at now, you have to, you have to be right rigorous and any time something associated with that story, those exact words come up, you have to choose something that... Um, will replace it. And you don't want it to be so much the opposite because that's like that uh, not failing is the opposite of like, I want to win, so I don't want to fail. So if you're focusing on not failing, right, then you're not going to win. So it was right. selecting that thing that wasn't the opposite, but was what he actually wanted to go for. So he chose um, that he wants to have, was it six? six best friends in the next six months. And that's what he was focusing all of his language on. So I had him come up with a couple sentences to like introduce them to people so that they'll get the feeling, right, that he's receptive to meeting people. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes along with that. So we came up with the language that he was going to use. And then all he had to do was he kept he kept using the book because this is what worked for him so anytime that the negative thing would come up or the thing that keeps not giving you the result that you want he'd open his book to all the positive things and the things that he created to say and he'd just read the whole list and then all that speech started to change and he called me up like at two in the morning one night he says i I have to consciously think about that thing now. It's not subconsciously coming up anymore. And it's like that if you broke a leg, like your body doesn't always remember that it broke a leg until you're like, hey, one time I broke my leg. So for him, it's completely changed now from I'm an immigrant, I can't do this, and all those negative impacts and all that stuff that it gathered to I'm going to have six best friends in six months and now he's like the life of every party when he walks in the room and he's started like four businesses that are highly successful here in Toronto. And, and I can't say enough about the guy. Like he's a totally different guy just from changing what he says to himself. So that's that how you become amazing. consciously aware of it. That is awesome. And I love that you, demonstrated it with a story because that was really cool um and uh in at, at one part there i i know i started to giggle a little bit but that was because your delivery of saying those two things together don't really work out too well like it was your delivery that i was giggling at not at the not at like the the story but you know i just wanted to, to clarify that but um that's amazing dude so so it seems like nlp is really effective when you are changing your own language in order to help yourself and to 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 make a change in the way that you're thinking and in the way that you're operating and in the story that you're telling yourself, right? Yes, definitely. So then how is well, let me ask you 
because two things pop up in my mind. One is how do you then take that knowledge and use that to maybe influence is the wrong word, but to influence others, like because your words definitely influence other people. Um, okay. And I feel like that's a whole can of worms is using NLP in your interactions with others, but then also how does hypnosis work with that? So. I don't know which one you want to go into first, but I'd love to talk about both of those. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with NLP because it's a little easier. Um, to, to influence other people, it's being conscious of just what you're saying to people. So like when you and I talk, we have a, a pretty long history now of speaking and we, we kind of get each other's vibe. So I know what I can say to you, and I know what I shouldn't say to you. Um, That is is the very basic first thing that you need to be aware of, which I feel like most people are, but they might not always listen to it. Be like, oh, I probably shouldn't say this weird joke, but I'm going to see what happens anyways, and then it goes terrible. Um, So it's (laughs) it's listening to that, and then it's... um, getting to know what that person wants. Like, I assume you want to use it for good. (laughs) So it's getting to know what that person wants out of their life. So that I'll use my wife as an example, and then I'll use my workplace as an example. So when I met my wife, she was, uh, in all measurements, way out of my league. She's eight years older than me. She had a business. She's a scientist. She's got PhDs. And I'm a stupid farmer from the country who's never been to a city in his life. So we met, and I immediately knew that I was going to win her over. Uh, And at this point, (laughs) I didn't know anything about NLP, and I also had very low self-confidence, but I was so driven by the vision that I saw when she walked in, like, this could be my woman, that I immediately changed how I was standing, how I would speak, and it was... Let me. I want to be accurate here. She was di- she was trying to get with a guy that she grew up with, who she always wanted to date, and he didn't really want to date her. So she was feeling bad about that. And I had heard it from some friend, mutual friend that we had uh, a few months after I first met her. So I just walk up to her, and I say, "Let me know if you know any s- pretty single ladies." And I winked and I walked away. And she says to this day that it was that comment that made her realize, like, is this guy interested in me? Could we really work out? (laughs) It was something so simple and kind of weird and lame. And it totally worked for who she was. Like, she likes weird and lame. Thank God. (laughs) So um, fast forward a year, we're married, and uh, she's been... Well, she's eight years older than me, so she's been li- living alone longer than I have. She has her own system for doing things. So I'm kind of bothering her now. And I just, oh, you don't like that is usually what, you know, you'll say when somebody kind of twinges if you're, like, stroking their face or something. Like, uh, like oh, you don't like that? Well, I'd say, oh, do you like that? Instead of do you not like that? So now in her head, it's associated with things that she likes instead of what she doesn't like. It's like, oh, no, I like when you do this. And she'll tell me instead of, I just don't like that, that's the end of it. She's like, no, I like when you do it this way, or I like when you do the dishes, I like whatever. So now it's a more hospitable environment. And it really, <laughs> like, we haven't had a fight at all in five years of being together because that's how I phrase everything. It's never in the that's negative awesome. connotation. Um, and that's really easy because we see each other all the time. That's an easy example of, of the usefulness, I should say, of it. Uh, and then at work, it's one person is like super ghetto, and like um, <laughs> uses phrases that I have no idea what they mean. Like the stuff she tells me is like problems that I've never had to deal with because I'm from the country and not like the inner city uh, where there's like crime and shit like that. Uh, another guy 
is a, a dude. Mexican. I didn't. I didn't think I'd be walking into a total comedy show today, but you have been cracking me up this whole time. Like I'm literally like almost to tears and like sweating from how much I'm laughing. But I'm sorry. Anyways, please continue. Please continue. Uh, and the other guy is a, a, a Mexican individual. And he speaks mostly in Spanish with the other guy who's from uh, the Dominican. So they speak Spanish together. So I'm trying to eavesdrop. And I convinced him to teach me Spanish so I can talk with them. Uh, and then there's a guy who's 65. So there's all these people that I have really no reason to get along with because we have such different lives. Um, when I started there, I thought, this is the perfect like, small city kind of testing ground. Because it's, it's like the main part of a lot of big cities, right? Each one of these people represent a, a kind of class or group of people. So I thought, I'll take all the stuff that I've been gathering and trying on people that I know my entire life, and I'll try it on complete strangers who have never met me, who don't even speak my language very well, some of them, and see what happens. <laughs> so I started just by being quiet, just by listening to everybody, listening to how they talk, even... Um, I don't want to get into too much, but body language, it was a big part as well. So after three or four months, I started cracking a few jokes, and it's like, okay, those are working well. I'll, I'll keep going down that road. I'll avoid kind of the things that I think are funny that they think are stupid. And it was a, a conscious decision just to, to pick out what drives these people and kind of makes them them. So after seven months of being there I was totally being myself now and there was really nothing that I could say that would upset them now because I let them be them before I tried to force myself onto them and they were super comfortable so now today um, they were they would always argue like there'd be a problem at work it was always somebody else's fault nobody wanted to take credit for the bad thing now because of the same subtle thing of putting the positive or asking a positive question about a negative situation, everyone's hand goes up. It was the team's fault that this didn't work. This is the part I was supposed to be doing that didn't work. And then the next person's like, yeah, and this is where I messed up. And even if you didn't mess up, people are putting their hands up that they messed up because they're part of the team. So just by letting people be themselves first, kind of looking and studying them because I'm a big studier. Putting in my positive, subtle connotation, it really changed how they acted with each other. And I was very surprised that they would turn into a team because they're an unlikely team. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially the 65-year-old gentleman. Uh, he's from a religion I've never heard of. They have been from my perspective, very strange practices like um, they can't talk while they're eating kind of thing. Like that's really weird from where I'm from because you just talk with your mouth full and who cares? Um, he asks me to go out for dinner now with like people from his group. Like I'm allowed to be into their presence, which was very shocking. And it it's just the way that I talk to them is almost 100% from a positive standpoint. And it's never... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I want to hear you. <laughs> um, it's... it's. How do, I, how do I word this? I don't talk much. So it's purposeful, short, uh, unless we're just dicking around and it's like time to screw around and, you know, it's the end of the workday. People are going nuts. During the workday, it's purposeful, short, concise, positive things that I'm saying to them. Even if it's about, like, you guys totally screwed up, and now I have to fix this thing. Like, if that's the situation, because uh, I'm the last guy to get the product before it goes out the door, so everyone else has to do their thing before me. So if it's the first guy that messed it up and nobody's called it, I now have to go back down each person and figure out where the problem is and then try to fix it like right away. So yesterday we had a, uh, I do custom vans in case 
people don't know. <laughs> uh, we had a van catch fire because the batteries were wired up wrong. We had a bunch of uh, mm. extra batteries put into this van, and somebody just put one wire in the wrong spot, overheated, fuse didn't go off, got yourself a van fire. So now, because when I'm testing things, right, I technically caught it on fire, so I go to my manager, like, listen, I burnt one of our vans, I'll do whatever I need to fix it, it's no problem. And then we get it sorted and it's done. So now I go down to the people before me, like, how can I help you do better at making sure this doesn't happen? It's not like you're a dick, why would, you know, you know better than this. You're an idiot. Kind of how I would talk to people before I became aware of this. Um, so it's, when you're asking people, how can I help you? It's, it comes across better as what do you like? Uh, oh, how do I put this? When you're offering your help, it's better than asking them if they want your help because almost everyone's going to say no, they don't want your help. So by putting it that way, like you're actually doing me a favor by letting me help you make sure that we don't mess this thing up. So now they have a beneficial reason to help me fix the thing that I actually want them to fix. And it, it cool. does, it does sound a bit like you're manipulating people. Um, and in all honesty, that's exactly what you're doing, but you're, you're doing it in a way that is a win win for everyone who you're communicating with. It, it also seems to me like, they have to be receptive to it as well because i mean yeah like you know we we may be using i mean you may be using and i'm gonna try to use them and you know be more cognizant of this but it seems like this sort of language and this use of language is very powerful but if somebody's just really not receptive to it is it still going to work or is, i mean are they just going to be like tunnel vision not like the 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 difference in language is just going to hit and bounce right off like it is it still going to be effective to people who are really closed off to any new language stimuli yeah um it it definitely does still work it just takes a lot longer because only 10 percent uh, of your brain like conscious and arguably only 1% of it is actually you being conscious of what you're doing. It's the other 9% is like robotic stuff you've always done. So then the other 90% is just absorbing everything all the time and you have no say in what comes in because everything comes in. So if you're persistent, you just keep chugging along. Eventually something's going to click in that person and they're going to be like, wait, what? That's interesting. That's cool. So then, yeah. how does how does hypnosis um, fall into the this whole realm of, of NLP and, and use of language? Yeah. So hip, hypnosis. <laughs> first of all, I should say that all hypnosis is self induced hypnosis. So I cannot put you into hypnosis and make you do things that you consciously would not be okay with doing. So that's 100% the case. So uh, hypnosis, you have, to, you have to be at least open to the idea of it, that it's not just a sham or you, know, you can get ruined by doing it. So you have to be a, at least 1% open to it. And then what it does is Think of the conscious mind as a floodgate that closes every time something comes up that you're not comfortable with or that triggers one of those subconscious weird things that people have. So hypnosis shuts that off. It distracts it over here, look at me, look at me, while it creeps into the subconscious and works on your belief systems and tuning those to what, to what you want and uh, each person based on how they're raised and all this input that they get over their life, they have like a gut feeling of things. And each person's gut feeling is a bit different. So hypnosis aligns your 
conscious desires beliefs with the like gut belief of how the world works and it just makes that work a lot faster than NLP does so can you go into an example of like how do what does that look like in in a, in a person like yeah. a real life example um so in it so India was one of the last places to get um, um, painkillers and like the stuff that puts you to sleep for surgery. I forget what it's called. Um, so what they used to do in big, big long surgeries is they would put people into a hypnosis trance and do surgery on them while they're totally conscious, but in a hypnosis state. Whoa. So you're keeping their conscious mind busy with a, its for me, when I'm doing it, it's a bit like watching a movie, but it's a movie that I'm writing before I'm watching it. So you could just about slap me in the face with a brick while I'm in a good hypnosis trance, and I wouldn't notice until I come out. Um, but that's just because I practice this all the time because I don't have anything better to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so that that's like a, a really useful way of doing it. And how it works is you get people to physically relax. So often you'll be you'll be laying down or whatever is in your physical uh, comfortable state. Um, I like to, to lay down on a beanbag chair because it feels really good. <laughs> um, so then you're physically relaxed and you can kind of melt the the body doing its body stuff, like all your digestion, all that junk that you don't have any say over, you can get your brain to kind of ignore that for a little bit, your conscious brain that is, to ignore that for a little bit. So now you have a lot more focus on uh, pretty much whatever you want. Um, so how I go into hypnosis is I look at, uh, this is going to sound a bit weird, but I try to visualize my lungs breathing. And that gets me super zen and relaxed because breathe, even taking two deep breaths when you're angry, right, it calms you down. Like breathing is a really calming thing to do. So I try to pretend that I'm just two big lungs that are just breathing and I just look at that in my head for 10, 15 minutes at a time. And then it's a bit like I all of a sudden realize I'm in a different place. Like if you were to wake up on a car ride and you're in a new place, that's what it is consciously for me. And then I realize that I'm in a, a good trance. It's like, okay, sweet. So now that I'm in this trance and totally physically relaxed, what am I going to do here? Oftentimes, I like to just see how messed up I can get things <laughs> to see if I can fix them. Um, any verbal stimulation that's coming in while you're in hypnosis is extremely key uh, to how your your hypnosis is going to go and how it's going to affect you. So I'll have in the background either um, my wife, I'll record her saying a statement or I'll, I'll do it like with my own voice. And that's what's going to be playing in the background on a timer after 15 minutes of me calming myself and being those big lungs. And that's going to lead to, um, well, whatever you, whatever you want it to record. So the other day I did uh, about an hour of trying to go back into my childhood and, and figure out why I'm afraid of being alone in water, which is really weird. It doesn't stop me from doing it, but I get this weird, uneasy feeling when I'm doing it, and I don't like it. So after doing that process, I had my wife just be like, how come you don't want to be in water. And that was all that was playing for like 15, 20 minutes. And it was really odd. <laughs> um, it was like I was time traveling back to when I was very, very small. And uh, my dad and I were roughhousing in our pool. And he's a, he's a big, like 300 pounds, six foot dude. He is a bad swimmer. And he kept me under the water longer than I could hold my breath for by accident. But as like a four-year-old 
it's like, oh, you know, this guy just held me under the water. What the hell? Dad, you're supposed to keep me safe. So then here's the thing of I'm afraid now to be in water because I almost drowned in this weird, stupid situation. So now that I realize that, I can change the uh, belief system around being alone in water. So you take uh, the phrase that comes with it or the vision that comes with it, whatever it is for you. For me, it's a lot of pictures and visual stuff more than words or sounds or anything. So I'll change that with what I want it to be, which is a Maui beach. Just chilling, being happy in Maui. And uh, it was a picture from my honeymoon. We went to Maui. And that's what I switched it with. And I had to do it a few times because it's a little tricky when you're doing it to yourself. It doesn't really work perfectly. Uh, so I did this process a few times, switching that scary, almost drowning picture with bitchin' beach Maui. And then I, uh, at my cousin's bachelor party, we were out in this lake, and it was really dark water. So I'm like, this is perfect. I know I'm afraid of this. Usually, I'm going to go stand out in that water by myself and see what happens. So I go out of there, and I get, like, neck deep. I'm just bobbing around, like, okay not feeling anything weird yet and I'm like trying to bring on this upset feeling that I usually have and it wasn't coming I just kept feeling happier and happier I'm like holy shit that totally totally worked and that's that's awesome that's what hypnosis can do and it can do a lot more and it can also do a lot less depending like I said on on the person re receiving it um, it's used a lot for people with PTSD. Uh, it's a good way to actually not have to take uh, medicine, like pills and crap like that, because you can, you can go and deal with the actual impact of the things that these people have seen and had to do in the battlefield and replace it either with a, a good enough reason that fits with who you are as to why you had to do that or something completely new. Or you can just get rid of it completely and not replace it with anything. It's fascinating. It's fascinating how many different applications these um, these two concepts have, and and also how interwoven they are. Because it seems like your language, your your use of language, just in general. You know, on the NLP side, has just an enormous impact on your life and what you think and the story that you tell yourself about who you are and like how you go about living your life. And then it also has such a big impact on hypnosis because if if those words or the that language that you're using is causing fear or maybe it's maybe it's causing ambition and you're like oh sweet like now i know what's driving me so much um that seems like it, it, it is extremely powerful so that's yeah. awesome man and, and i want to thank you so much for uh for coming on and and uh talking about this stuff i mean i I've, i really do find this fascinating and um you know we we talk uh talk about this from time to time and i'm glad we finally got to like drill down hard in it even more um on a, on a live stream so thank you very much for that one more question for you and then I do want to wrap up uh, wrap up pretty soon you mentioned um, uh, a while ago how you know we've we've we have a, a history now and you know the things you can and cannot say to me right I'm interested to know what are those things that you would classify in the don't say to Ben category <laughs> don't say to Ben category. Um, I got to be honest with you. There's probably like pretty confident that I could say anything too, and you wouldn't get completely irate. First of all, but I like um, I wouldn't just out of who I am. I know you're Jewish. I wouldn't make like Jewish cheap jokes that some of my friends might make with me, like. I don't really like those kinds of jokes to begin with, but they feel they can do it to me because I, I'm a quiet person. I don't really complain about anything. But I wouldn't like 
go out of my way to say them to you. Whereas if I knew that it would impact somebody, like if I was trying to get someone to notice something, I might use that kind of language or that kind of awful shitty joke just to slap them into a different kind of way of being. But I wouldn't use that on you because it wouldn't have the any kind of positive effect. Is it my assumption, of course, because that's all life is, is our assumptions of everything else, and it's just a bunch of assumptions. <laughs> um, but what I would use is, like, the intrigue. You're a very curious person, much like me, so I just have to, like, leave little pieces of bait if I want to <laughs> entangle you into a conversation. Like, hey, what do, you, what do you think of this? Have you heard of this? Are you trying this? And then it's like, bam, we're off to the races. Same if Dang. I want you to look at something. I just call you out on it, right? Like, uh, there was an instance, something was going on with a family member of yours. I'm just like, hey, you're doing this. And you're like, oh, shit, I'm totally doing that. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. You definitely have me pegged, bro. That's cool. That's really cool. Um well, again, man, thank you so much for uh, for for coming on on the stream and uh, and talking about all this stuff. I know you've put in like tons and tons of hours and and studying this and practicing this. So um, I'm very appreciative of you coming on and and sharing the things that you've learned and uh, the things that that you actively practice. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Awesome, man. Well. Uh, uh, I think we should uh, wrap it up, wrap it on up here. I'm getting tangled over my words. But anyways, thank you again uh, to everybody who's listening and watching. Thank you all very much. I'm going to uh, wrap it on up right here, close it down. But Matt, once again, you're the man, lifestyle architect at the top of his game. You're awesome. Thank you, man. Have a good one. You too.